So some of you may have seen in the Washington Post last week, there was this report that showed that Gallup had found that for the first time since they started polling people in 1937, we officially have less people in our country um, affiliated with a religious organization than there are agnostics and atheists and spiritual but non-religious people, which has come as kind of a shock to a lot of people who are surprised at, at just this real steady decline that we've seen since the 1990s in organized religion and in people who who choose faith as part of their lives. Um, so what's happening? You know, what's going on between Americans and the church? And um, what does it have to say to us today? So beside that, there's this whole other body of research that I've gotten super excited about and interested in, in my own life, in my own study. And it's said to be the largest and most detailed study ever undertaken of its kind, and it involves our nation's youth. Um, and in a book titled Soul Searching, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of American Teenagers, it um, is summed up by this man named Christian Smith. And the report revealed that a surprising 60% of America's teenagers actually believe that religious faith is is an important part of their lives, and they believe that they have that. So that's kind of interesting to compare beside the Gallup poll where we're seeing 40% of adults not religious, and then we see 60% of our youth um, who believe that they are. So what does that mean? You know, Are the kids fine? Um, and does this other data just project the good news of this coming pivot where all of us are going to get kind of restored back to our previous version of Christianity and other religions on the shoulders of our youth? Um, maybe, but Smith goes on to summarize the results further by explaining that the overwhelming message of this study suggests that the dominant religion among U.S. teenagers is actually one that he identifies as moralistic, therapeutic deism. Um, and here's the creed of that religion, and I think some of us might find it kind of familiar. The first part is that a God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on earth. The second is that God wants to be good and nice and fair to one another. He wants us to do that, as taught in the Bible and in most religions. The third is the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. The fourth is that God does not really need to be particularly involved in anyone's life except when God is needed to resolve a problem. And good people go to heaven when they die. So that's the dominant religion in our country right now. Um, it's the dominant religion in our youth. And they didn't make this up on behalf of themselves. This has been passed down to them through cultural and family osmosis, you know, and it's also being passed down to them by churches. Um, but they're, and it's not necessarily that people say that this is what they believe. What's more important is that they're living as if they believe it. Um, and that, how we live and what we do is actually what represents our truth. But what about what I just listed above? What about this fragmented sense of religious principles could really be the good news behind our alleluias on Easter morning? Is this the story that Jesus came to tell us about through his life and death and resurrection? about some far-off kind of genie-like God who's mostly out of things and just sends us off on this individualized quest for happiness until one day we all just kind of show up in some other better place? And is Jesus really just mostly an irrelevant, get-out-of-hell-free card? Is this the good news? One of my favorite things about Easter when I was a little girl was the singing of Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. And even though our church wasn't very big and our choir wasn't very heavy in numbers, there was just something so compelling about hearing it echo through our pews. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. King of kings and Lord of lords, hallelujah. It's all there in six short lines. It's the victory cry of Easter morning. But how often do we sit and hear it and sing it and even believe it from the pews, but then just head off into the world and live in that fragmented version of religion that I just explained? How often do we turn to a world where the kingdom of our Lord is distant? 
and where the reign of Jesus appears as nothing more than a future promise for another time and place. And where we are just kind of left here trying to be kind enough while we direct our whole lives in pursuit of happiness. And really, it's very American of us to do that, right? Because our Declaration of Independence, even it says that one of our inalienable rights is to pursue happiness. Thomas Jefferson believed that there was something innate about human beings to the pursuit of happiness and that there was something sacred in our ability to do it. And that because of the way we were made, something might be fragmented in us if we weren't able to. But what is happiness exactly? Is happiness a feeling? Is it something that I can produce on behalf of myself? Is it living a long and healthy life? Is it achieving something? Can I find it in a person or in a thing? Is it something I can consume? Honestly, when I just pictured this list of common things that we might describe in our own pursuits of happiness, I, didn't, I just pictured kind of like a scattering you know, of all of us, just off in pursuit of our own individual ideas. You know, I'm going to go find my happiness here, and you're going to find it here. Um, and is the, somehow the Christian-esque version of the moralistic therapeutic deism that I just described, just that as the stone was rolled away on Easter morning, that all of God's people just went pew. <clears throat> off in their own search for meaning and purpose and value. And the only thing left unifying us then would be just our common hope for heaven later. But biblically speaking, such scattering and disorder are not signs of Jesus' lordship. They're symbolic of exile. They're what happens when people turn from the will of God and go off to seek happiness elsewhere. It's a sign that somewhere along the way, some idol became the object of their worship and their love, turned them from God in pursuit of that. And in this moralistic, therapeutic deism, happiness is not a sacred end, it's a dangerous and deadly idol. And to be clear here, the pursuit of happiness is not bad. But idols tend to not start out that way. Idols tend to be good things, that only turn bad on account of our exploitation of them. Eve didn't reach for a sword or a spear in the garden. She reached for fruit, and fruit is good. But it was reaching for the fruit that turned her away from the will of God, off in pursuit of something other. And that reshaped her from a steward to a lord, and it malformed the garden along with her. And it left God's presence in a distant past. And it turned creation into a landscape to be subjected to a kind of slavery, to human ideals for production and consumption. An object to be depleted in the name of human wants. That's the outcome of idolatry. It disrupts the source of our power, and instead of us moving on behalf of God's presence and power, we're forcing ourselves out into distant lands where we find our strength in ourselves, and our nourishment comes from ourselves instead of God's abundance, and our finite efforts are compared to God's infinite means, and none of it can be sustained. So when the Industrial Revolution introduced stuff like the tractor and then chemical fertilizers and pesticides to American farming, there was this pull that redirected the farmer's focus from being good stewards of their land to being producers instead. And it started out from this genuine concern over rising populations and the fear that we might not be able to continue to feed all the people who were showing up in our nation. Um, and soon, through the help of machines and additives, the farmers no longer had to rely on the ancient practices and ways of engaging with the complexities and mysteries of creatures and creation. And instead, they could just eliminate everything they didn't want to deal with and just pour all their effort into produce. Um, and they had found this happiness in that because they had freedom, and then they were growing wealth. But 
In orchards, these new ways of farming enabled them to train fruit trees upwards, which seemed great because when you do that, you can just fit them tightly in and instantly increase your pounds per square foot. But it, what was lost in that shift is root development and stability. And so instead of having strong outward limbs that were characteristics of ancient fruit trees, they were just these tall trees that were always liable to, to just topple over. Um, and it means that they're also not absorbing nutrients beneath the surface the way they used to. And added to that is the issue that the pesticide applications are slowly sterilizing the soil and they're killing off all the microorganisms and the fertilizer doesn't restore the trace minerals and the way, in the same way that manure and organic material does. And it's hard to tell the implications from this when you're just at the grocery store and you're comparing apples to apples. But what's interesting is that there's this phenomenon called hidden hunger where we're eating the same fruit that our ancestors used to, but it's not giving us the same thing. We're consuming it, but it's missing something. Because these new practices that were developed entirely for production and ease in the pursuit of happiness are robbing our tables of substance and depth. And today it's just leaving us hungry and wanting more but if we don't change our direction, future generations will have nothing but an empty plot that they can no longer cultivate. Jesus tells a similar story. And if you spend any amount of time with me, you know that I tell this one all the time, but I just think it's so instructive of how our pursuits give shape to our lives um, and how what we pursue on earth forms not just us, but the world. So, which is, that's exactly what happens in this story. And I know that the favorite thing to do with this one is to just kind of pick your box and sit in it, like you're the older son or you're the younger son. But what I want to ask you guys to do with me today is just sit with me in the story of the younger son for a minute. The younger son who began with a good beginning in his father's home and who set off to this distant land and demanded his inheritance because he wanted happiness because he wanted something that he thought he couldn't find there. And so he went off to exploit it in a distant land. This is Eve. This is Adam. This is Israel. And this is us over and over and over again. Every single time we place pursuing happiness over the kingdom of God, every time we opt to pursue anything apart from God's presence, and it leads to exile and depletion every single time. And that's what's happening to this young son, right? He's, he's lost in this far off land and he's scattered himself and it's left him starving and depleted in a land that looks just like he feels. Have you ever had one of those weird moments where you poured yourself into some end? You know, whether it was like the pursuit of a job or the pursuit of some possession or finding a spouse or some vacation, whatever it is, and then you got it and it was right within your reach and all of a sudden you realize it wasn't happiness that you were feeling and it was like kind of a weird kind of emptiness instead. It's kind of like a kid on Christmas evening, you know, where there's wrapping paper everywhere and before all the dust has ever even settled on everything they got, they're looking around for something more. It's because the happiness in this world will always fail us. It can't sustain us. It can't fill us in a way that meets the demands of hearts that are made to house God. And whenever we set off away from God to pursue it apart from him, it's always going to leave us feeling empty and diminished. Because even though we think we're leaving God with everything we need in our possession, we might not actually even know we're leaving God at the time. And we set off with our wealth and our strength and our gifts and our everything. It becomes finite the moment it's separated from the power and presence of God. It's in proximity to the Father. 
that our inheritance is made real. And no amount of reaching or striving or pursuing can prevent us from actually looking up from it all one day and noticing that we're in a land of death, that we're surrounded by widespread famine, one formed by a bunch of people just off seeking to exploit and consume and produce on their own behalf. And the imagery is so powerful in this story because he's starving to death and he's feeding pigs. This is the world that Jesus was born into. Jesus arrived into a land that was hungry for God's presence. He arrived into a land that was exiled. He arrived to a lost people who were searching for a way home. And just as the Holy Spirit beckoned that son to remember his father, giving him everything that he needed to come to his senses, those parts of our hearts that are still longing for more, the parts of our hearts that look around at the world and just grieve it, the parts of us that just think this isn't home, that's God beckoning us to turn and head back to him. And through Jesus, we have a way that leads back again but we have to choose it. There's a way, but we have to take it. The hallelujah of Easter morning awaits us, but we have to redirect our pursuits towards it. We have to seek the kingdom of God now. And when we turn and pursue it, we find on the road the hand of God meeting us there, pouring out his grace on behalf of our restoration, redressing us with robes that indicate we are people that have an identity in our Father's home. And that identity gives us a vocation on behalf of our Father, one informed not by some story of scattered individualism or a slavery that awaits in some other world, but one rooted in Scripture, which gives us a story of a God who has been working on behalf of creation to bring goodness back to earth since the dawn of time. And this is where our God-given uniqueness fits in and flourishes, and our gifts and strengths come out. Where we're empowered and set loose by God's power and presence in pursuit of his good ends. And we're nourished on the road by the feast and community that's found at the celebration of his table. And we find our cohesiveness, not in being the same, but through our shared intention to pursue God's way. Jesus did not come to the world to destroy it or to leave it to die at a distance, but to redeem it. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. It isn't a question of if or when. It's just will we choose it? Are we choosing it? And to answer that, all we have to do is look at what we are giving our lives towards. From where and to what end are we putting our time and our energy and our gifts and our resources? Because that's going to become what we make of our lives.